The Hunnic Empire for around 80 years had continued to expand over most of continental Europe at a breathtaking speed. This continued expansion of the Huns was possible because of the absence of relatively serious internal political conflicts. Attila rose to supreme power in the mid-440s, after he violently usurped the throne from the supreme ruler Blida, his brother. After he ascended to power, he drastically shook the fundamental makeup of the Hun state. To successfully carry out his usurpation of the throne, he seems to have relied heavily on the support of the tribal groups in the western half of the Hun state, such as the Gepids, to suppress the eastern tribes that supported Blida. Attila was so dependent on the Gepids, that one Greco-Roman source actually called him a Gepid Hun. These western tribes grouped around Hungary, and before the usurpation of the throne by Attila, they had been just fringe elements within the Hunnic power structure that favored the eastern tribes in the Ukrainian steppe zone. The usurpation of Attila was not just a minor palace affair like all previous political squabble, as it was followed by a massive revolt by the powerful Hunnic tribes. Throughout the reign of Attila, he had favored the nobles from the west of the Hunnic Empire over those from the east, which was completely opposite of the steppe empire power distribution, where the east was always to be the more powerful and main center of power. Attila's key nobles Angesius, Arderic, Idiko, and Valamer were all western notables, whose power base was located close to the Carpathian Basin, to which Attila now permanently moved the Hunnic center of government. Attila's usurpation and favoring of the west over the east, which was the complete reverse of the traditional alignment and distribution of power within the steppe empire, therefore had a catastrophic consequences for the political stability of the Hun Empire after his death. Part of this instability was due to the sudden nature of his death, which gave him no time to solve the issue of succession and to organize an orderly transfer of power to designated heirs. The disaffected Hunnic princes and nobles who had kept quiet during Attila's reign now all started to clamor for attention, and the principal power brokers sought to resolve the question by force of arms. Thus an internal military conflict arose, and this had fatal consequences for the unity of the Hun Empire. So right after the death of Attila, his sons had divided up the subject nations equally among themselves. We have no idea how many sons there were, but we know that this is the only occasion in Hun history, so far as we know, when a father's kingdom was shared out by his sons in this way. They did not just divide the land equally that their father Attila had ruled over, but according to the people who occupied that land. Land without men was of no interest to the Huns now. It is unlikely that these sons completely cut themselves off from each other after they divided the kingdom. But when each of these new rulers retired each to his own domains, each with his own followers, concentrated military action at short notice by the united Hun forces became impossible. Shortly after this division, what Aetius feared was proved right. Attila's empire began its first stage of crumbling. Three of his sons, Elek, Dengizik, and Ernak, fought among themselves. The reason was that one or more of them, tried to rob others of their share of the inheritance. Several great battles were fought between them as a result of this. Jordan's pointing out the political and moral lessons from this, writes, A struggle for overall control broke out among Attila's heirs, for the minds of young men are often inflamed by an ambition for power. Each was driven by a rash desire to rule, and together they destroyed their father's empire. Thus kingdoms are often burdened with a superfluity, rather than a shortage of successors. After the civil war among the sons of Attila, the military strength of the Hun was impaired, which paved the way for a rebellion of the subject nations. Disunity among the Huns was exploited by their subjects. The rebellion seems to have been started by the Ostrogoths in the Theus Valley, where they were moved by their masters long before. But this was just the beginning. The great revolt of Germanic peoples was led and inspired by Arderic, the king of the Gepids, who was a confidant of Attila. It was he who raised the hearts of the Germans for freedom. After several bloody battles, 
It was probably in 454, in a great conflict at the unknown river Nadao in Pannonia, that freedom was achieved. The Ostrogoths who seem already to have been free, took no part in battle, and some of the subject nations still thought fit to support their masters. But the Gepids were joined by the bulk of the subjects, including most of the Siri, Rugi, Swaby, and Heralds. The Huns were overwhelmed by a new confederation of people once part of their empire. They won the battle, and claimed to have slain 30,000 Huns, and among the slain was Elek, Attila's eldest son, who was the governor of the Akat Siri. For Jordans, this was a swift reversal of the fortune, he writes. And so the Huns were halted, a people to whom it was once thought the whole world would yield. So destructive a thing is division, that the Huns, who were so terrifying when their strength was united, were now brought down separately. Traditionally, this has been presented as a war of liberation fought by Germanic people, led by King Larderic of the Gepids, to free themselves from the Huns led by Attila's chosen heir Elek. But Hyun Jin Kim presents this war in a very different way. According to him, it is hardly an accurate description of this war. He argues that this war was a strife over fief distribution among Hunnic princes, and not a revolt among Germanic subjects against their Hunnic rulers. The confusion about the nature of the conflicts that followed after the death of Attila was due to the assumption that the key figures with Germanic-sounding names mentioned in Gedica of Jordans, which is our principal source of these events, were native leaders of Germanic ethnic origin. These men were in fact Hunnic rulers of largely mixed origin. And so the wars they waged against each other were thus civil wars within the Hunnic system that led to the dissolution of the imperial order. He adds to his point that archaeology, from the area occupied by the Gepids, actually shows that the ruling elite of the Gepids were a heterogeneous group, displaying some Mongolid features all throughout the 5th and 6th centuries AD. This was no doubt the result of intermarriages with the Huns, and the presence of actual Huns within the Gepid aristocracy and ruling family. The Gepid elite was culturally and physically the most similar to the Huns from Asia of all the Germanic peoples. Noticeably the practice of Hunnic cranial deformation was extremely common among the Gepids. Arderic the king of these Gepids was able to defeat Elek, because he managed to gain the support of not just his Gepids, but some of the Subi, Rugi, and Sarmatians as well. Almost all the tribes in the west seemed to have sided with Arderic against those of the east. But why does Arderic feature so prominently in Jordan's account? Kim says that it is because Arderic was also most likely a Hunnic prince. The Huns in the traditional Inner Asian manner distributed conquered peoples as fiefs to members of their royal family and senior nobles. The Gepids were a significant fief since they formed the core of Attila's revolt against his brother Bleda and therefore Arderic had this privileged position within Attila's retinue and his principal role in the civil war following Attila's death. Kim gives the example of Attila's blood relative named Laudericus, who died at the Battle of Catalonian Plains. His name is entirely Germanic, and this tells that having a Germanic-sounding name is not an indication of one's Germanic ethnicity within the Hunnic Empire. That Arderic was a member of the high Hunnic aristocracy is further evidenced by the fact that one of Arderic's grandsons named Mundo, the nephew of the Gepid king Trapstyla, was called both Gepid and Ahan, and was in fact a descendant of both Attila and Arderic. Kim then states that every other major figure to emerge out of the Hunnic civil war was also like Arderic of Hunnic provenance, or a high-ranking official in the Hunnic imperial court. Now enough of these debatable topics, and let's get back to the sons of Attila after the defeat in the revolt. So after the defeat, surviving brothers with the remnants of their followers fled across the Carpathians to the shores of the Black Sea. But they were not content to remain there, they or some of them, soon began to filter back again across the Carpathians to their old homes. And soon they were seeking to restore their fortune by falling upon Volomer and his followers. The Ostrogoths had been isolated politically, there was tension between them and the Gepids as they had not supported the Gepids at the Battle of Nadal, so now they had to stand alone. 
the Huns managed to surprise Valamir, before his brothers could come to his aid. But the result was another shuddering defeat for the Huns, only a fraction of whom escaped from the battlefield under Ernak, to take refuge with Martian's permission, at the confluence of the Danube and the Thais. For the rest, we hear nothing except occasional raids by isolated Hun bands, and of the settlement of the Huns on the soil of the Eastern Empire by Martian. Some Huns were settled in company with a body of other barbarians, in the neighborhood of Castra Martis, which had fallen to Olden long ago. Dengizek once again tried to assert his dominance over the Goths. This time the Ostrogoths were attacking an unknown people called Sadagi, so he assembled the few tribes who still remained under his control and set out for a campaign. Coming to Bashiana, a city in Pannonia lying to the east of Sirmium, these Huns began to devastate the countryside, but the Ostrogoths fell upon them, and Dengizek was defeated. After this defeat, Dengizek drops out of history, but he reappears towards the end of the 60s. In the year 468, an embassy arrived in Constantinople, we are told that it was from the children of Attila. Probably there was some battle that had taken place, because the purpose of this embassy was to clear up the difference that existed between the East Roman government and themselves, and to negotiate a peace treaty that would reopen the market towns along the Roman frontier to the Huns. But Emperor Leo saw no reason why the benefit of Roman trade should be given to the Huns, and so without much consideration, he declined the embassy. When the children of Attila heard of the failure of the embassy, they disagreed among themselves. Dengizek wished to declare war upon the Romans, but his brother Ernak refused to join him. He declared that a war was already going on inside his own dominions, and it has occupied him completely. Therefore Dengizek undertook the campaign alone. He appeared upon the bank of the Danube, where he was met by the master of the soldiers in Thrace, named Anagast, the son of Arnegisclus, who had been killed during battle with Attila. Anagast sent some envoys to ask Dengizek what he wanted. The Hun contemptuously sent them back without an answer, and himself sent an embassy directly to Leo, declaring that if the emperor would not give land and money to him and his followers, war would be the result. Leo offered to allow the Huns into Thrace on the same conditions as the Goths. In exchange for resettlement, they should recognize the authority of the emperor. Dengizek refused, and crossed the Danube to invade the Roman provinces. Ernak towards the east was apparently combating the Saragurs and other Oguric tribes who had defeated the Akatsuri earlier in 463 AD. We find the Saragurs invading Persia to the south around this time, possibly due to resistance encountered in the west from the Huns under Ernak, which halted their expansion in the west. Due to this war, Ernak was unable to lend help to his brother Dengizek, and so he was forced to depend on the recently reconquered Ostrogoths, and the equally unreliable tribe of the Bidigers. The unreliability of his troops and the lack of support from Ernak would prove devastating for Dengizek. The Romans, according to Priscus, somehow managed to corner a group of Goths in Dengizek's army in a hollow place, and then foster rebellion among them, by sending a Hun by the name of Kelchul, who was in Roman service, to incite them. The Goths' revolt apparently spread, and forced Dengizek to withdraw. Shortly after this, Dengizek was killed in an unknown circumstance. Anagast son of Arnegisclus, received the title of defeating Dengizek in 469, and Dengizek's head was brought to the eastern capital Constantinople for the show. The fate of Ernak remains unknown, but the oracle, which foretold that he would restore the fallen kingdom, definitely did not come to pass. The main strength of the Huns, such as it was, remained then on the lower Danube during the reigns of Leo and Zeno, but they did not all play the part of plunderers of the Roman dominions, some were glad to take service in the imperial armies. At the time of Dengizek or a little earlier, there is an account of a certain Kelchul, who was serving under Anagast, against the army of Goths, who was supported by yet another company of Huns. Companies of Huns were also found in the service of the Western Romans very soon after the Battle of the Nidau. 
In 457, Huns were enlisted in the army that Madrian had assembled for his projected campaigns in Gaul and Africa. But the Huns mutinied, as he was about to set out from Italy. Other Huns too were enlisted to take part in Majorian's planned invasion of Africa. The famous Marcellinus Count of Dalmatia, who was supposed to have occupied Sicily to shield the island from the Vandals' attack, had an army that included a very considerable band of Huns, but they were as faithless as the previous Huns. These Huns were bribed to leave Marcellinus in the lurch, and Marcellinus could do nothing more than retire from Sicily, and allow Geishric to devote his undivided attention to Madrian. Treachery and mutual division were their strongly marked characteristics in the latest days, as it was also in their earliest. Priscus tells us that in the middle of the 60s, ambassadors arrived in Constantinople from the people of Saraguri, the Aguri, and Anaguri. These nations had been driven out of their homes by Sabiri, who had themselves been set in motion by a nation whose name is now mentioned for the first time, the Avars. What had set the Avars on the move? The people who lived beyond them on the shore of the ocean, and these people in turn were driven from their home, as reports said by a ferocious brood of griffins, who were only destined to stop devouring the human race when not a man was left alive. So as one nation set its neighbor in motion, the Saraguri had at last been thrown on the Akatsiri, whom Attila had subjected in the year 448. They were now conquered again after a succession of battles, and their conquerors had come to Constantinople to win the friendship of the Eastern Romans. But they were only the forerunners of the nations pressing westwards behind them. A dozen years after Attila's death, the steppe was drenched by floods of new and warlike nomadic barbarians. The steppe was now crowded with military nations, among whom the pitiful remnants of the Huns played nothing more than the role of minor robbers and cattle raiders. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you did so, then like the video and subscribe to this channel for more such content. And thanks for watching.